And it's so important that you're here to hear what the campaign's doing and learn how you can plug into what the campaign's doing. So first we have some special guests we want to introduce and have them give, a, uh, give you a few words. So um, we're going to introduce our special guests. My name is Michelle Ching. This is Stephen Gibson. We're part of the field staff here in LA. We are so Friday night, but good thing it's a Korea town, so you can go out afterwards. Um, again, um, I'm a field organizer, he's a regional field director, and tonight we have the honor of welcoming Jane Kim, our state political director, as well as one of our national surrogates, Dr. Paul Song. I'm just going to give a brief introduction and then let him take it away, and then we can get the show rolling. So, Jane Kim is, as I stated, the California State Political Director. Jane was the first Korean American ever elected um, to be elected an official in San Francisco as a member and then president of the San Francisco Board of Education. She later went on to serve on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors between the years 2011 and 2019. And as a member, um, and she's also a member of the San Francisco Democratic County Central Committee. Before her political career, she was a civil rights attorney as well as a community organizer. Dr. Paul Song is our national surrogate and an expert on Medicare for All. Paul serves on the executive board of Physicians for a National Health Program, California, Progressive Democrats of America, and Healthcare Now. Uh, in 2013, he was named and served as the very first visiting fellow on healthcare policy in the California Department of Insurance. He is also the grandson of the late Son Don Kim, the first popularly elected mayor of Seoul, South Korea. So um, with that, let's welcome our guests. Um, we'll have... Big shout out to our LA team here um, that's part of the Bernie 2020 team to Steve and to Michelle and they're outside but Lewis and Danny um, as you know we have six regions here in the state of California um, that we because we really want to treat California like the state of Iowa which is why the senator has hired 80 full-time staffers here just in the state of field office in Oakland on Sunday and we have another office opening actually this weekend so that'll be 15 which is pretty amazing um, and I said this to the group that met earlier um, the senator made very clear when he started hiring this team in June that California was a priority for him for a number of reasons one we're an early state we have the most delegates in this country 495 delegates so we matter and in my lifetime at least this is the first time California is going to have an opportunity to have an outside say on who the next nominee for the Democratic Party will be. <laughs> second, and even more importantly to the Senator, this state is actually representative of this country. It's not Iowa or New Hampshire that often has this outside voice in who the presidential nominee is. California is reflective of this larger country. And so even symbolically, he wants to win California because we are what America looks like today. And so um, he has invested heavily in the state. It was really important for him to ensure that people of color were in senior leadership um, throughout the state of California and also in his national office that we spoke multiple languages. Um, we are kind of the API barnstorm, although everyone is welcome here. We're the first campaign to come out with signs and lit in Korean, Vietnamese, Tagalog, and Chinese. And I thought, I mean, I have a little bit of time, and so I want to talk a little bit about kind of my, my relationship to the campaign and how I came to be here. Um, so I, as Michelle mentioned, I served for 12 years um, in San Francisco as a local elected official. Uh, prior to that, I was a community organizer and a civil rights attorney. And I'm really proud to have had the support of the community and also the support of the senator when I ran in 2016. And one of the reasons why I had developed a relationship with the senator is that actually my all women of color legislative team and I, in 2015, were really inspired when we started to see him run as he was talking about Medicare for All and College for All. And by the way, I was a little late to the vote on that one. Paul was the one that actually told me early on that the senator was the candidate that we should be endorsing and the senator that would be our next president of the United States. It took me a little longer to get there. 
Um, but we were inspired by this message. And so in San Francisco, we, uh, we actually crunched the numbers. Um, our all-female team were like, what would it take to actually make college free in San Francisco? And we actually thought it wasn't that much. It was about 10 to $15 million. And so in 2016, I introduced an ultra-luxury real estate transfer tax that would generate about $30 million for the city and county of San Francisco. We got the senator to endorse our measure. We won. And in 2017, we became the only city in the country to make community college tuition free for all of our residents. <laughs> but we were inspired by his message. And, you know, at the local level, and many of us are local organizers and activists, we really do have this opportunity to pilot concepts that feel like fantasies for other municipalities. And in some ways, especially here in LA and the Bay Area, we're fortunate to be actually from wealthy regions. Whether we are individually wealthy or not, our regions are wealthy and have opportunities to raise revenue. And, and so in some ways, we have this responsibility and privilege to push the boundaries and actually showcase and demonstrate that progressive policies can first of all pass and implement it and show people what it means when we do things like make college free. So we had a 25% increase in enrollment in City College in the first semester in 2017 after we made Community College free. And, and by the way, like Community College means so many different things to different people. It is our only lifelong learning institution. You can go back to Community College at any point in your life. Um, and in San Francisco, we saw that the average job that was being marketed for someone with an associate's degree from community college was roughly about $12,000 more than for an uh, individual with just a high school diploma. So hopefully we're putting more money into the pockets of everyday citizens. Um, fast forward the next couple of years, and I think even I have been incredibly astounded by the impact that Senator Sanders continue to make even after his loss. I don't think there is a single elected official that has had um, a greater impact to the Democratic Party than Senator Bernie Sanders. Every debate you watch, every single question is about his agenda. Yeah. And, and for a progressive activist, I never in my lifetime, A, first of all, thought that there would be a viable presidential candidate as progressive as, as Senator Sanders. And two, I never thought that that agenda would be the mainstream agenda that we're actually discussing and debating amongst all the Democratic Party candidates. And he has, um, well actually, I, I love AOC's phrase about this, we're not pushing the party left, we're bringing it home. <laughs> and so for so many reasons, this campaign is important. And by the way, I have to emphasize again, the Senator has said we're not just about winning the primary on March 3rd, we're also about investing in the movement. So you all know that the Senator is the only candidate that has more uh, contributions than uh, Donald Trump. He was the first candidate to hit a million um, individual contributors. We have raised the most money of any Democratic Party candidate. But our average contribution is $18. The most highly listed profession is a teacher. The most highly listed uh, employers are Amazon and Target and Starbucks. And so when we invest those contributions into this California operation, we're investing millions of dollars in California. The Senator has made clear that we're not just going to win March 3rd, we're also going to invest in the organizing infrastructure within our region, which is why we have six teams. It's not just a statewide team, we have six teams. And so we're plugging into what's happening in the community. So I know there's someone here within our schools, our community petition. Right? Somebody here? Yes. <laughs> the Senator was the first to come out and endorse this measure to split goal Prop 13, one of the most regressive measures that we've seen here in the California where we've lost a third of our public school education funding. Um, and we have a measure to, um, to bring that back and to tax our commercial landlords that really don't deserve that break um, and to bring those dollars back into our communities. And so our campaign is gathering signatures for that measure as well. Because again, it's not just about the senator winning on March 3rd. It's about all of us being uplifted by the movement that we're building here. So please sign that petition. about whether I wanted to come full-time onto the campaign, I really thought long and hard about it. And it was in May that it dawned upon me that, that beating Trump isn't enough. 
I don't want to go back to the America of 2016. Yeah. That's, right. that's, that's not what I want. That's not why I'm here fighting in this campaign. Because long before Trump walked into the White House, homelessness was a crisis in cities across the country. Long before Trump walked into the White House, evictions were being disproportionately carried out against the most vulnerable in our country, whether it was immigrants that speak English as a second language, African American women, individuals with, with disabilities, and seniors. And long before Trump walked into the White House, our immigration system was in shambles. And here in the state of California, in the last 40 years, we built 23 state prisons and one CSU, I mean one UC and three CSUs. And that was basically our statement on what institution we were investing in young Californians to end up in. Right, one year in state prison can cover three semesters at UC Berkeley. And if you know, if you were lucky enough to go to a UC, even in 1990, after Prop 13, we used to cover 78% of your tuition. We now cover 37%. And by the way, when I say San Francisco is the only city to make community college free tuition free for all of our residents, community college used to be tuition free all across the state of California until 1983. So all of these concepts that we're talking about that's so radical and how are we going to pay for it, they, they are actually a part of our history. And, and the whole concept of us having a social compact right, with our citizens, whether it's a free and universal K-12 through education system, right, needs to be expanded. And, and this is why, because I was watching the debate um, the other day when Pete was, Mayor Pete was asked like, why he didn't support extending it. He said, well, you know, high school is what we expect people to complete. That was great in the 1950s and 60s when we made that initial decision. Actually, the, the decision to invest in a free universal K-12 system was a very radical decision um, in the early 1900s. But actually, at that time, a high school diploma was enough to get a middle class job. In fact, if you graduated from high school, you were likely to go into the middle class. We know now that that's no longer true. By next year, 70% of all jobs are going to require some type of post-secondary degree, training, or certificate. And so that is why the senator and his agenda of expanding the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure which we provide our citizens to be successful is so important for all of us. And I know Paul is going to talk a lot more about Medicare for All and why that's so important. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying um, thank you. Um, so much for coming out. Um, but what I know is that working for Senator Sanders and every hour that I'm able to invest in this campaign is the most patriotic thing that I can do for my country. And so, and so whatever you can give to this campaign, and by the way, ballots drop in 16 days. Is that right, Brandon? 16 days? 16 days. 16 days before Californians start voting. Whatever you can invest in this campaign um, over the next month and a half, the, the four hours that you come canvassing with us on Saturday, the three hours that you come phone banking with us on Wednesday evening, or the $18 that you make your recurring monthly contribution to your campaign, is your investment in our country for at least, at least the next four years. None of us want to wake up on March 4th and wish that we had given one more dollar or one more hour to this campaign. And so we're polling number one in the state of California, and that is thanks to everyone here in this room. But we have to still win, right? And then after March 3rd, we want everyone to go to all the other states to ensure that we can do this. But I'll just repeat, I'll just say this again. We can actually win this. We can actually win this. This is not a pipe dream. This is this is happening. We are polling in first state uh, in first place in states across the country. We can do this, but we can only do this together. And here in California, we've had 760,000 individuals volunteer on this campaign. And that, that's extraordinary. Um, and so I just want to thank you again. Eventually, Michelle and Lois and Brendan and Steve are going to go over what we're actually going to do to win on March 3rd. But before we do that, I want to bring up my really good friend, Dr. Paul Saw.
for um, anyone thought he had a shot. And so I'm really lucky to have him today. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, just can we get another hand around the bus? Uh, I can't wait to see the position Jane will have in the administration because she is fearless and has always given a voice for those that don't have one. Um, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, one, for those of you who don't, um, that I haven't mentioned before, uh, my name is Paul Song. I'm a radiation oncologist by training. Been um, uh, in California for about 12 years. Uh, my mom actually came to the United States in 1951 as a refugee during the Korean War. Um, after many, many years learning the language, she was actually able to graduate from Columbia Teachers College. And the first person to hire her was uh, Shirley Chisholm. So for those of you who don't know, you may not know, Ms. Chisholm was the first African-American woman elected to Congress, uh, and she was a fierce champion for the things that Senator Sanders uh, espouses now. Her motto was that she was unbought and unbossed, and unfortunately we've had far too po many, a few politicians that are unbought and unbossed. We have a, a stranglehold of many of our elected officials, not only in the Republican Party, but unfortunately the Democratic Party, we're beholden to corporations, we're beholden to insurance industry, pharmaceutical industry. Um, so when you talk about Medicare for All, um, just to give you a little background of that, I started my practice in 1996, a long time ago. And first few years I was enjoying practice, but then I, as an oncologist I saw far too many of my own patients going bankrupt strictly because they developed cancer. And these are people that had insurance, particularly those women that had been fighting breast cancer for five, six years, had just been battling and they had exhausted their co pays and deductibles and their uh, maximum caps. But even in spite of that, I started to realize we have a broken, immoral, and unjust healthcare system. And over that period of time, I really started to look at what was it about our healthcare system that was so bad. And what you soon came to see was the for profit, really immoral aspect of that. And that's where I started to say I couldn't turn a blind eye and just collect a paycheck, I needed to speak out. Now, when I started to speak out, there were very few people that were espousing Medicare for All. You couldn't even find anybody that was quoted in the Democratic Party that would say they were for Medicare for All. But Senator Sanders, back when he was a representative, was always for Medicare for All. So, um, over the last few years, um, matter of fact, Michelle, when we met, it was when I was giving a, a lecture to a community health center on Medicare for All. There, the, the, the skepticism in the audience was so great. But what's changed over the last few years? I think it's two things. Um, so I was involved in the marriage equality fight, um, and one of the things that I thought really helped was when my friends uh, came out to their uh, families, to their neighbors, to their workers, to everyone. And they, you could put a human face with the people that were being discriminated with. In much the same way, our healthcare system, every one of you probably at some point has been harmed by our healthcare system. Either your co-pays, deductibles are too high, you haven't had the time, you've delayed seeking care because of that, or because of your network being so narrow, you can't get a doctor in a timely fashion, maybe you have private insurance, you lost your job, you're now on Medicaid, and guess what? Very few doctors in the area take Medicaid. One way or another, each of us has a horror story, and I think in much the same way, people started to share what was wrong with the healthcare system with their family members, their neighbors, their friends. That was the one reason, but probably the biggest reason was you had an old senator with a vision that was not afraid to run on Medicare for all four years ago. And the combination of those two things, now it's gotten to a point where the majority of the people in the United States think we should have a single pair Medicare for all system. And that is really all a tribute to Senator Sanders not wavering one bit in that message. As we go into this next campaign, though, it is so vitally important that we really make sure that he finishes the job this time. Because for some reason, if he does not get elected, people are gonna say, oh, it was because he ran on Medicare for All. When in reality, most of us will do, all of us will do better under Medicare for All. So one of the things I would ask each and every one of you to do is if you have somebody in your family who has been harmed by this healthcare system, if you will let us know, and if they might be willing to share that story, because we really want to put this, make it personal, so people realize why this healthcare system is not working for them the way it is. Uh, finally, I'm just gonna say this. Um, when we uh, the, uh, think of how to define our society, I think the most of us believe 
we're defined by not how great we are, but how we care for the least among us. And I think that's why the, the, the motto, us, uh, uh, us not me, means so much to me personally, because that's what this campaign is about. It's about us all coming together and picking up those that have been left behind rather than trying to you know, find loopholes for the, the 1%. And finally, I'll just say this about what Jane was saying. Um, you know, 2016, uh, we, we, while we would all like to go back to that year to now, um, there were so many people that were left behind. The number of people that were foreclosed here in the state of California. The number of people, I have a, a family member who they lost their house. And that's not the type of safe government we need. We need government that will take care of everyone. So with that, just thank you for being here. Thank you for getting involved. And let's go win this once and for all. Hey there, how's everyone doing? How's everyone doing? You know, it's really interesting. Um, I get a little emotional here, I'll tell you why. Since the summer, we've all been dedicated to this work. Grinding it out every day, building our relationships with Jane and Danny and Brandon and Melissa Byrne, our grassroots, um, uh, uh, grassroots statewide director. And it, it's occurring to me that there's a sense of urgency, number one. <clears throat> but we're on the verge of winning this thing. 17 days, 16 days, <clears throat> ballots are dropping in California. And we're on the verge of winning this thing. Like, I'm literally shaking at the thought of what's going to happen in February and what's going to happen in March. Because... There's forces out there that will do anything to make sure that we are not successful. To make sure that Bernie does not become the President of the United States. We have Big Pharma, we have the military industrial complex, we have the Republican Party and Donald Trump. Imagine we are this close, and being this close they will do everything they can to make sure that we don't win. So what, what does that take? That takes hundreds of thousands of us talking to millions of voters. And we've already done the, me the meaningful work. Imagine Bernie is polling number one in key states, number one in California. That is because of the dedicated work and the tenacity and the brilliance of the grassroots volunteers and the dedicated staff who whom you've all worked with. Let me give you a little context here. In the past two weekends, in Los Angeles County alone, many of you were contributed to this, we knocked on 25,000 doors in two weekends in a row. And I'm going to tell you, that second weekend, they have this thing we call volunteer drift. If you don't maintain and keep pushing and keep developing what we're doing, and all of y'all don't keep turning out, you have volunteer drift. So then that's our job as field organizers and super volunteers to maintain that we all stay on point. But we went to this critical state retreat in Bakersfield, in beautiful Bakersfield. <laughs> and the entire state field staff came, and the reason for that meeting was so that we all get on the same page and we simplify. Danny Anderon often um, quotes, um, uh, what's his name, Wooden from UCLA. And he says the first season of every season, regardless if you're a senior or a new incoming freshman, he picks up the basketball and he says, this is a basketball. This is a basketball. We're going to the basics. We've done all the meaningful work. We've built our capacity. We've found our leaders. We've developed, um, we've cut our turf. We're targeting. We have an incredible data team who's working with us. Now we have to get to the basics. So what we did was when we were in that retreat, trying to figure out what are we going to do, this is what's going to happen, and from here we're launching, and the next time we see each other, Bernie's going to be the, uh, the nominee. We are celebrating that. But we did not 
have an opportunity to maintain our volunteers, to work with our volunteers, because our staff is up there planning out this, uh, working on this retreat. But what we did was, our field organizers had a dedicated group of folks who were making those recruitment calls for us. We replicated ourselves, like Sean King says. We had zero volunteer drift because of the dedicated work of folks like you. We can't do this alone. You can't knock on 25,000 doors with a staff of 14 um, field organizers and, and so on. This is a political revolution, a political revolution that is moved by, the, by people power. Please don't let that be lost to you. So when we do these barnstorms, there's a thing that we call the momentum cycle. When I was doing barnstorms in the summer, the tonality is completely different now. You got the same old script, but I'm changing it, and I'm going to tell you why. This is the time. There is no turning back. We have 16 days. Stephen, how many days do we have of canvas days if we just do weekends? It would be four weekend days. Four weekend days till ballots drop. Yeah. So what does that tell us? You got to walk for 16 days. You got to call for 16 days. And then from that, that's one GOTV. What's the next GOTV? How many? February 22nd, the uh, polling places will open on February 22nd. How is Steve? And how many canvas weekends do we have there? That's why, uh, what is that? I'm losing bad, but this is summer, so I don't have to see. But my point being is, we, we're running out of time, folks. If we're calling ourselves a political revolution, let's make that change. Let's do it. Let's make this promise to ourselves. The reason why you're here in Barnstorms is because we're doing Barnstorms in the first four states in California. And like Jane said, California is in play, over 400 delegates. Bernie is polling number one, but that's not enough. That's not enough. We slip up once, we lose one day of canvas, we lose one day of not talking to voters, they're going to catch up to us. And I'm asking each and every one of you to have this sense of urgency. This sense of, 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 of duty and commitment. You, you are here for a reason. Because you're leaders. You're not here to listen to Jane. You're not here to listen to Dr. Song. You're not here to meet this guy. Who's half annoyed by the way. And I'm very proud. <laughs> My mother passed away when I was at a barn store. In November. And I don't know if some of you experience this as Asians, but when you're growing up, you know, my grandmother was so, like, you have to speak English and you can't be, you know, you have to be an American and you have to, like, you know, do, assimilate. And uh, I was almost raised, and then in the 80s, kids, you know, made fun of you. They called you a flip, and, you know, in our days, I don't know. So in a lot of ways, I was ashamed for being Filipino. But Bernie has brought this camp, this campaign, brought, brought us together because he's brought all these communities together. So my white Latino roots and my Filipino roots, I am proud of my AAPI origins. I am proud of my friends who I've met through Bernie. And what we must not be lost to any of us is that this is, so in electoral politics, here's what we do with people of color who don't turn out. We only talk to the, we don't talk to those folks, like 80% of, of, of the electors, especially here in Southern California. So did any of you hear the podcast, the New York Times podcast that came out? You heard it? Okay. You heard it? Remember, Reggie, what we talked about when I played that last part of it? Yeah. What the New York Times observed? Yes. They said, number one, that we know that people of color don't traditionally vote. And Bernie is putting it all on the line for those most marginalized, for the unengaged, for the inactive, and we're going to make them active. I'm telling you, politicians do not invest in these communities. I have been on those teams where we just concentrate on 10% of the voters, and we ignore 80, 90% of them. And this is what the, the reporter said. She said that if we are successful, we, 
are successful, then we will change, it will be a revolution of the political landscape for people of color across the country. And I can tell you specifically, Danny and Alain have talked about this constantly, it will change California politics. Because what will happen is, these folks who have ignored us, the 80% of the electorate, will realize they need you to become elected. And that's true political power. And we've talked about that from my day as a teenager, Dukakis, and I, you know, and so on. But Bernie is the only presidential candidate who's making that investment. It's more than a strategy, in my opinion. It's about, the, it's the right thing to do. Because win or lose, and believe me, Bernie's going to win. But win or lose, Bernie has made the investment in these communities. We are talking to people in the Latino community, in the Asian community, in the black community. We are actually making an effort, and we are talking to these folks. We are listening with empathy. We are speaking with compassion. And I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes these working class people, they're struggling every day, folks. They're struggling every day. They don't have time to understand what Medicare for All means and how it's going to be paid for and all this stuff. But I'll tell you one thing that they know. It's not what you said, but it's how you said it. And we're going to say it with love and we're going to say it with compassion because I'll tell you, the two greatest things that human beings can get on this earth is your love and your labor. And if you can give both, then that's a movement. So when we leave here, we're going to plug you into the work. And I'm not doing a big ask anymore. This is a demand of ourselves. So in our spirit, we call it the big ask. Let's be cheery. Let's make an ask. I am demanding of each and every one of you to demand of yourselves to come to our canvases, to knock on those doors, to help us build capacity so that we can knock on 50,000 doors this weekend, so that we can knock on 100,000 doors. Because if we don't do it, folks, if we don't do it, I'm not even going to say those words. And you know what I'm talking about. Like that New York Times reporter said, if Bernie wins, it's a political revolution for all persons of color. And if we reach these voters and they turn out, that's what will happen. If we don't reach those vo vo voters, she said, Sanders loses. And here's what my further analysis of it is. This is the last chance that any presidential candidate or any candidate will make an investment in, in our community. If we lose this, it will confirm to all those naysayers that they were right, that you don't matter. Understand that. If we lose, it will confirm that you don't matter, that you don't matter, that you don't matter. That's what will happen. But if we win, it is a revolution. And if we will prove them wrong because we all matter and we know that. So when we make that ask and that demand of you to do the work, please, I will remember every one of your faces, and I hope to see you uh, at these campuses. And I mean that with love. I mean that with love. Because I promise you, on election day, on election day, face each other and say we did every single thing that we could. Every single thing. Like Jane said, every dollar that you can contribute, and we're working class folks. But do it. Every hour that you can knock on that door, we call it time on turf. The more time on turf, the more doors you knock. The more doors you knock, the more people you talk to. The more people you talk to, the more they hear Bernie's story. And they get it. That's how we win. One neighborhood at a time, one community at a time, one district at a time. The opposition does not have anything on us. We got the love, and we got the labor. Am I right? Plug into the work because we're going to get this done and we're going to win this thing. Thank you so much. Yeah.